nomadic, strength, and resilient. Hello there, and thanks for tuning into the Brave Files podcast. As you may have noticed, I am not Heather Vickery. I'm Alan Seals, Heather's co-host for Was It Chance, the podcast about embracing opportunity and taking intentional risk for your creative life. If you haven't listened yet, I would love for you to go give it a try. We've interviewed some incredibly wonderful and successful people, including, most recently, Jim Jamiro, the man who invented the Disney Channel and Disney Home Video. It's an incredible chat that you have to listen to. You can listen wherever you're listening now, wherever you find your podcast, or visit the website, wasitchance.com. So now, on to the Brave Files. Since Heather's on vacation this week, she asked me to welcome you all to this week's episode where she sat down with now viral TikToker Beth Hughes to talk about her journey through domestic sexual assault, losing her four-year-old son in a tragic accident, and how embracing forgiveness has allowed her to connect with her son's spirit and be resilient through her life. Social media is a pretty powerful force and allows for connection in unexpected ways, and that includes creative learning and communication. As a new adapter to the very famous TikTok, Heather was shocked by how many amazing people were out there changing the world only one story at a time. That's where she was first introduced to Beth and how she came to invite her to be a guest on The Brave Files. Special thanks to Beth for taking the leap and doing her first podcast interview with Heather. While the loss she shares is great, so is the beauty of how she's continued to love, live, forgive, and show up in the world. Let's meet Beth. This is Heather Vickery, and you're listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. When we choose bravely in big and small ways, it powerfully elevates our lives. I hope these stories connect with you and encourage you to embrace bravery in every possible way, day after day. Together, we can build a movement of courageous living that enriches both our lives and our communities. And if you enjoy the show, I ask you to please share it with others. Maybe think of someone who you want to choose bravely right alongside you. Thanks for tuning in. Now here's the show. Hi, friends. Welcome back to the Brave Files podcast. Today's guest is here to share her painful and yet somehow fascinatingly enlightening journey through really hard shit, y'all. Loss, grief, sexual trauma. Beth Hughes has a deep, energetic connection with what I like to call the beyond. I I don't, I can't wait to hear what Beth calls it. I don't even know. Uh, But especially with her eldest child, whom she tragically lost in an accident when he was just four years old old. And this, I believe, has been a defining character in the direction that Beth's life has gone. Uh, I met you on TikTok, Beth, and I can just (laughs) fucking love that. But welcome to the Brave Files. And thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, thank you, Heather. Thank you for reaching out to me. I appreciate being here. Yeah. Uh, Your story really just spoke to me. There's I feel I have not had, thankfully, the kind of tragic loss that you've had and we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, But I do have some sort of connection to beyond what is is that we can see. And I sort of always have. And there's something about your energy as I'm like quick scrolling through TikTok. I'm like, well, wait, so I need to I need to watch this. I need to hear this. And I sort of just felt you through the screen. That can't be the first time you've heard that. No. No, I, I I have, and since I've gotten brave enough to put myself out there on TikTok, I hear it more and more, and uh, it's definitely given me the courage to tell my stories. Mm, yeah, I love that. Well, let's start. I mean, is is your son Eric the right place to start with this conversation, or would you like to start prior to that? I guess just a little background. Um, I was in the military. And okay. I was going into my eighth year when uh, I realized that my, uh, I was divorced and I realized that my husband's family really didn't have, uh, they didn't know my, their grandson like they should. And I had taken a part-time job with a major airline while I was still active duty okay. and I had free flying. So I made the decision to fly to them. They lived about a thousand miles away. And we spent a long weekend uh, there with my ex-husband's mother and uh, her extended family. That is a very nice thing. I am also a divorced parent. So that is a, that is a nice thing to do. Did not work out the way you 
wanted it to, we're going to get there. No. And, and the reason they didn't know him was uh, my ex was very abusive. I actually put him in jail uh, for what he did to me. Uh, That's a whole nother story about that happening to me while I was in the military. Uh, So I was dealing with all that trauma. I flew my son up to stay with them. We spent a Saturday and Sunday there and he was having, he was just having so much fun that they asked if he could stay uh, a little longer and I could fly back. And I made the decision that yes, he could stay. And uh, the last time I saw my child was running for an airplane. You know, I, I gave him a quick hug, not the kind of hug I would normally give him and, uh, and ran for my plane. And then the week went on. He, I talked to him every night. He was having a ball. He was at their friend's farm with their animals and just having a great time. And the night before I was to fly back to pick him up. Uh, that day, I, I talked about this on TikTok. That day, uh, I I had a girlfriend who was pregnant with her first child. She and her husband, we were very close, but we hadn't talked in a couple months. They were military too. And uh, I jumped in my car and went over to see them. And they weren't home. This was before cell phones. And uh, so I came back home. About an hour later, I look out my front window and their cars pulling into my driveway and I met them outside and I was laughing and I said, I had come to your house earlier today too. And you weren't home. And they said, we, we couldn't stop thinking about you today. We wanted to come see oh, you. Oh wow! And uh, <clears throat> as we walked inside my house, my phone was ringing and I, I answered the phone and I recognized the voice. It was the pastor, the man who had married uh, my ex and I, And uh, he told me that my son was gone and I didn't believe him. I started screaming into the phone and crying. And thank God my friends were there because my, my girlfriend grabbed the phone from me and took over. And I, I just can't imagine going through that without having them there with me. And uh, you know, the fact that they couldn't get me off their mind that day. Yeah. Yeah. How lucky was I? that something was looking out for me. Mm. Beth, I have four children and um, there's no ability to comprehend. Th- thank no. goodness. I don't have the ability. Like, you know, some, some unfortunate parents can comprehend. I, I don't, he was your only child at that time. Yes. No, I had an 18 no. month old. I had an 18 month old and, uh, you know, I, I've been through it and I still struggle with the right words to say to people when it happens to them, when they join this horrible, horrible club. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I have three other children and, uh, I, I struggled a lot after losing Eric, you know, fears. Of course. I, I had to teach myself to be brave for them letting them do things that I was terrified of them doing. And it's kind of funny because they've all become adventurers and they live their life very fully. And Mm -hmm. uh, so all of us have learned from this to, to not hold back and don't let fear control us. And it's going to be okay. Yeah. How you lost Eric is beyond my ability to understand. Are you comfortable telling the audience how he passed? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, from what I, w- obviously I was not there, um, right. but from what I was told and the letter that I received from the girl, the lifeguard, my mother-in-law had taken him along with her girlfriend to a local lake. And she had gone out into the water and carried a small like lawn chair with her and she was sitting in the water with my son as he played and they called for an adult swim. So everyone had to come out of the water and then the adults had like 15, 20 minutes just to mess around in the water without any children, give the kids a break. Uh, My mother-in-law stood, turned her back to my son for a second to fold the lawn chair, reached for his hand and he was gone. And um, there were, a group of guys that were older, they had been drinking. 
Uh, they were roughhousing and throwing a football and they were running into the water. And uh, it's, it's believed that they trampled him. Mm-hmm. My mother-in-law thought he had run out of the water and panicked and screamed to her girlfriend who was sitting on the, the shoreline. And uh, when the lifeguard heard the commotion and saw the guys, she stopped everything and had everyone leave the water. They all gathered and held hands and went into the water and found my son. And he was pretty well bruised. Um, I did receive a letter from the lifeguard. Uh, She was only 18 years old. Mm. And uh, she, uh, she told me that she gave CPR to my son and that uh, he opened his eyes and smiled at her and shook his head no, and he died in her arms. Oh, my God. Sorry, my voice cracks. No, Uh, no, no, don't be sorry. So um, I have a lot of thoughts about that young girl. I've worried about her for many, many, many years, I did hear, uh, she did write me a a beautiful letter about my child. And uh, I did find out many years later that she was married and had children and she was happy. And I, of course, worried, how does an 18 year old deal with that? Absolutely. And uh, I remained very close with my mother-in-law. I never wanted her to think that I blamed her in any way. Unfortunately, uh, there's been a lot of people in my life that did not understand that choice of mine. Um, but I know how much she loved him and I know she, she did nothing wrong. Yeah, it would be, it would be how we want. I mean, I, I, that's something about you that I deeply admire just from the limited exposure that I've had with you. It would be hard not to be angry with her. Of course it wasn't her fault. And of course she would never have wanted this, but as a parent, I would be like, I, I need somebody to be mad at. And <laughs> she's yeah. like, I don't I, know. You know how, I never, how, you, how you did that. I don't either. I don't either. I, um, I know, forgiveness, I guess is, is, mm. um, it's something that we have to teach ourselves, I guess. But, um, I tried to put myself in her shoes and yeah. I know that, I know how much she loved him and how much fun he was having. And, uh, and I, I, I tried to think of it as if I had been there with them, would the outcome would have, have been, been different? different. Yeah. yeah. You write about forgiveness. And of course, forgiveness is about us. It's about those who do the forgiving, not about those who are forgiven. Yeah. It's, yes, it's it us breaking those chains. And it's so freeing when you do that. Um, I mentioned that my son's father was abusive. He, he hurt me many times. Unfortunately, the military didn't handle it very well back then in the late seventies and early eighties. And, uh, we were, we were silenced. The women were silenced as to what was going on. And, uh, of course I got, I got away from him. He went to jail and, uh, I moved across country to, because I was constantly looking over my shoulder. I just thought he was going to come after me again. And years later, I heard through the grapevine that he was very ill. And something told me to get a hold of him. To back up a little bit, he had actually contacted me maybe 12 years after everything that had happened between him and I. And he was in some kind of 12-step program, and he was asking for my forgiveness. And it Mm -hmm. scared me so bad that he had found me. I said, yes, I forgive you. And I didn't mean it. But you didn't. Yeah. I I didn't. I didn't mean it. I was saying it to appease him and to get him off the line. And um, it bothered me for many, many, many years. And when I heard that he was ill in a hospital out West, I called five different hospitals trying to find him. And the last hospital I called, the nurse said, let me connect you before I could, you know, even think, "Uh oh, what am I doing? And uh, he answered the phone and I told him that uh, I had lied to him and that I had told him I'd forgiven him a long time ago and that I wanted him to know that I'd forgiven him. And he actually passed away the next day. And uh, what we were saying before, the relief, the, I mean, 
it was selfish on my part because, um, well, I mean, we say that, but it freed me. It freed yeah. me from looking over my shoulder all the time. It freed me. My nightmares weren't as bad anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it gave me some closure. It gave me some closure. Yeah. That is some testimony. That is some testimony. Are you a religious person, Beth? No. Okay. Um, I, I had a very good childhood. My mother was very sick, unfortunately. So I kind of latched on to everybody in the neighborhood. And uh, we grew up in a Catholic neighborhood. And uh, I would go to the church with my friends. And it just, a lot of the things they were saying never made sense to me. By the time I went to the military, I was searching out different uh, denominations and different religions just to try and get a feel. And uh, I, spiritual spirituality, I guess, is probably the closest thing. Yeah. I spend a lot of time in nature. That just all makes sense to me. It makes, to me, everything we need, we've been given. It's just being brave <laughs> enough yeah. to look yeah. inside and figure out. Yeah. And that know, we are source. It. We yes. are the source. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm, this, I'm exactly the same way, completely. Uh, but you, I know, because this is how we, we met, you yet somehow have a very deep spiritual connection to very unexplainable things, especially surrounding Eric's death. Yes. Can you share some of those stories with us? Um. Well, I already I already told you about my friend showing up at the last second before I received the phone call. Yeah. Uh, the next evening, uh, friends, or actually that evening, friends were gathering at my house. I was um, I was going to fly. My family was living in Ohio. I was going to fly up to Ohio. We have a small there's a small cemetery in Ohio where I had planned on burying my son. So they were helping me gather my things to fly. And uh, most of it was, I, I, I'm sure I was in shock. I don't even recall who most of the people were at my house, even though I knew them all. Mm -hmm. uh, but at one point I was sitting on the floor against the wall and a woman approached me and this, this beautiful woman, this beautiful black woman, and she sat on the floor next to me and she started talking to me and um, she started telling me about my child. And I can remember staring into her eyes and just like shaking my head in, in agreement with her as to everything she was saying. And I, I was a little baffled as to how she knew my child so well. She, she made mention that my child had seen his father beat me, mm. um, you know, things along that line. And uh, I kept saying, yes, yes, yes. And we talked for a while and, and she said some things that just resonated with me and stuck with me forever. And she, we said our goodbyes and she left. I assumed that someone from the military had sent her because I was not religious. I was not affiliated with any religion. Right. Um, that maybe my squadron commander, base commander had sent someone. A few days passed and I was talking to some friends and I mentioned her and said, I'd really like to find out who she was associated with. And um, no one claimed to have seen her. No one said they remembered her. Wow. And I remember her vividly. I even went to my squadron commander to thank him for sending someone. And that's when I found out that no one had been sent. Uh, who that being was, where she came from, how, you know, I, I have no answers. I know how I feel about it inside. I feel like, again, I, someone was watching out over me. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned I have other children. My son, who was 18 months old when Eric was killed, uh, it was six months later. It was around Christmas time. We were walking the neighborhood looking at Christmas lights. He was now two years old, and uh, he kept looking over his shoulder and looking over his shoulder, and then he said, uh, Aries here, and Eric had trouble saying his name, and he called himself Airy. And it was almost a year of my two-year-old talking and playing with his brother, and uh, to the point where the daycare center that I took them to, took Eric and my other son to, they actually had me come in to talk to me because 
my two-year-old was making the women uncomfortable. Wow. Yeah. And uh, then it was quiet for quite a while. I had my daughter. And then years later, I had my youngest son. And uh, there's 11 year age difference. I actually misquoted on TikTok. I said nine years and uh, it's actually 11 years. Okay. Before you, you had your youngest son, because I I'm, I'm eager for you to share that story. What were the ways, if there were any ways that you sort of kept Eric's memory alive in your family and for your children? Were there, was there anything notable that happened there? Um, for me, his birthday and the day he passed, of course, I think about him all the time. And course, some yeah. days I can handle it and some days I can't. Some days I can talk about it, some days I can't. Um, but on his birthday and the day he died, I still had my free flying. I still do to this day. Uh, I would jump on a plane and mm. and go somewhere. I would just, usually I'd go to the airport and whatever the next flight going out was, I would just get on it and go walk around the city. Or I was running away from my grief. And I was chasing my child's spirit. And um, I felt him on my travels. And uh, I've continued to do that for, it's been 30 plus years, 34 years. I'm, I'm not even sure off the top of my head now since I lost him. Chasing his spirit. What does that mean? When I'm out in nature, especially I, I'm usually out west. Um, currently, I'm on the East Coast visiting one of my children. Uh, but normally, I'm out west. And um, I like to be in the wilderness. I like to be out in the middle of nowhere. And it's it's almost like I can feel him with me. Uh, when, I, when I'm getting tired and I see this hill up ahead and I'm thinking, I'll oh, turn around. It's like I can hear him say to me, he always called me mama. He'd say, mama, let's go see what's over that hill. And I just, I feel him with me. I, I, mm. in the flowers and I know it sounds corny. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't it's, to me. No, it, I see him everywhere and, um, keeps me strong. And I know he's looking out over all of us. My children, even though my second to oldest was only 18 months old when Eric passed, my other two children, of course, never knew him. They talk about him. They have his pictures in their homes. They're mm-hmm. very close. We, yeah. uh, we keep his spirit alive in a way. Uh, at the, that. at the time when he passed, um, f- family members did not handle it well. It was n- not something I could go to them and talk to them about. It, That's so unfair. I'm sorry that that happened. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, you want. I started sharing stories about my son on Facebook, on his birthday and the day he passed, I would always write something. And uh, it, to me, it was like, I'm forcing people to remember him with me. And the funny thing was uh, people in the military that knew me back then, they had their own stories about my child that I'd never heard. Oh, wow. They had their own memories of my child that they shared yeah. with me because I was yeah. sharing it in a public way. And um, what I wasn't able to get from people that were close to me because they couldn't handle it I was getting from others and strangers, really. And especially with TikTok, uh, the response has been overwhelming. And yeah. I, I mean, I went on TikTok to talk about being a solo female traveler in an RV. And I happened to answer a question by a woman that posted a question about the worst phone call you ever got. And uh, I saw that 700,000 people later, I'm I'm talking to people and People are talking to me about their children, and some of them were in the same situation I was, where they didn't have anybody that they really could talk to about it. So that that feels good. I it it helps me, and it seems to be helping them too. Yeah, I it's brave. I I feel to, but also it takes an, uh, I think an only a lived experience ability to just own it, to own your story and to not worry about what anyone's going to think or what they're going to say about your desire to share it or to talk about it. I've done a lot of reading. I'm fascinated with the idea of quantum physics and the idea of, of, uh, we are all one Like we talked about, like we are the source. We are, are all one. And, and I have no doubt that, that Eric says, let's go look over the mountain. I mean, I believe, yeah. That feels very 
natural to me. Yeah. That's kind of how I always thought of it. It's they're, they're just, they're there with us, you know, it's, um, yeah, you and I think a lot along the same lines, it seems like. <laughs> yeah, I think so. It's one of the things that um, had me paying attention even before I, I knew the whole story. All right. So enter your youngest son. This is this is a pretty fascinating part of your story. Uh, so the 11 year age difference. Um, my youngest son was four years old when this happened, the story. So the same age that Eric was when he passed. When he passed, yeah. yeah. And it was Eric's 15th birthday. And I was getting ready to take off. My friend was going to take my children uh, for two days. And I was going to head out and uh, go wander and follow my child's spirit. And I was in the bathroom and my youngest son would sit on my feet when I was getting ready in the bathroom, playing with his toys, his Legos. And we were talking. And of course, you know, I had told my children that I was, it, you know, what day it was and that I would be uh, going away and they would be staying with a friend. And my four-year-old, while he's playing with his toys, sitting on my feet, asked me, what happens when you die? And I stood there and again, I did was not raised with any religion. And so, yeah. you know, my mind started racing, thinking, how do I answer this four-year-old in a way that is appropriate for him? Uh, so I start talking to him about different religions and what their beliefs are. And uh, I get to reincarnation and I say to my son, can you say that word? And he does. He's still not looking at me. And he repeats the word. And um, before I could say anything else, he says, I've come back, but I've only come back twice to you. <laughs> wow, I have chills. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry, my voice is going to crack. <clears throat> take, take your time. Take your time. He, uh, I looked down at him and uh, I said, Eric? And my youngest son looked up at me and said, what, mom? And uh, my youngest son's name is Ian. And uh, it was a while. He, he, it's funny. I did not tell this on Facebook, uh, not Facebook, on TikTok. He, my parents had both passed when my youngest was three. They'd both passed from the same cancer. Mm, I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you. And uh, when I was in the military, one of the things that they let us send home from basic training was this giant gaudy Bible which was funny because we were not raised in religion, but right. I see this Bible and I have it engraved for my mom and dad and send it home. Uh, that was one of the things that came back to me after my parents passed. And my youngest son would walk around with this Bible. I did not raise my children with religion either. Okay. But my youngest son would walk around with this Bible that was almost as big as him. And he would sit down and he'd open it up and point to pages and start telling stories about the pictures and you know, every once in a while, he'd be saying, this is Paul, and this is so-and-so. And we'd all be like, how does he can't read? <laughs> how is he getting the names right? <laughs> yeah. So the running joke with my children was that my youngest son would probably be a minister one day, would probably be in some kind of religious field because, you know, his attraction to all this. But um, he talked about my son. He He never... Uh, he never came across like Eric was coming through him again to me, but uh, it was brought, he brought my son up a lot. I see my son in each one of my children in their laugh or their, you know, their sense of humor or things yeah. like that. But um, that night uh, before, well, that after that incident with my child, my sister had called to check on me. And we were talking and I said, I want you to talk to Ian and ask him what he said to me earlier. So my sister's on the phone with my youngest son and I hear my child say to her, uh, they gave me new blood and bones and told me to go back to mommy. And I took the phone from him and my sister wow. said, I think I was just talking to Eric. And I said, yeah, I think I was too. So... Wow. There's a connection. Yeah. There's a connection that we don't understand. There's too many stories. Uh, you know, I still try and be skeptical on certain things, but I know what's happened in my life. 
And uh, there's so many things that have gone on in my life that just make no sense at all how I have succeeded or, you know, how I've come out of things. Uh, there's a lot more. There's so much more than what we even know. Oh, absolutely. Have you had any conversations with Ian as an adult about reincarnation? Yes. He's, uh, he thinks along the same lines as we do. Ian is, uh, Ian's definitely my nomad. (laughs) He, uh, every once in a while, he'll look at me and he'll say, you see Eric in me, don't you mom? And I'll say, I see Eric in each one of you, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, each one of my kids, I mean, there's, so, there's still so many stories. Uh, I, I had mentioned to you before we started that uh, I've been writing my stories down, putting them in book form, uh, because there's just been so many things. Uh, my son that was 18 months old when Eric passed, he went through a period in his life where we would joke and say he had nine lives because so many things happened to him that he should not be here anymore. And uh, he miraculously is. And, Somebody's uh, got his back. Someone's got his back. Yeah. Right after I lost Eric, uh, Tyler was probably two and a half, maybe. I was still in the military. And uh, I was walking down the hallway past his bedroom, and he was crouched down playing towards, you know, on the floor. And out of the corner of my eye, as I turned to walk in the living room, I saw his little body, like, fly through the air. He had stuck my car keys in the wall socket. And it, yeah, you know, you're not supposed to do that. No, you're not supposed to. I didn't even know he had my car keys, but, um, you know, that was, that was the beginning of what we always called his nine <laughs> lives, rushing him to the hospital and all kinds of stuff. So yeah, I, uh, I've dreamt of Ian for years. It's the same dream all the time. I'm in a black room. He comes to me carrying a book. His favorite book was, um, I'll love you, you forever. S- you said Ian, but did you mean Eric? Oh, yes. I'm sorry, yeah, Eric. That's okay. Yeah. Eric. Uh, I'll love you yeah. forever. Good. Lord, I can't get... When my kids were little, they would know what page I was going to start to hyperventilate on that book. <laughs> like my third daughter in particular, we would approach that page and she would start to like pet me because she knew I was just going to start sobbing. That's a devastating book. It is a devastating book, isn't it? And uh, yeah, that's the book in my dreams that he would always bring to me. And uh, I could always tell there was someone off in the void in the distance. They never, I never saw them, but he would sit with me and we'd read the book. We'd finish the book and then he'd say he has to go. And as he walked away from me, he went from being four years old to 30, Mm. 31, 32, 33, as you know, just so much comfort. So much comfort. Yeah. Well, I certainly hope you write the book. I'd be happy, uh, you know, I'm no expert, but if I can do anything to support you in that journey as an author, let me know, or even just as a friend, because um, I think there are people, you know, we need, we need that. We need to know it's, it's a human connection. It is. And, and I've tried to write it in it. it they're like short it's like a memoir or a short yeah, essays, yeah. maybe kind mm-hmm. of a David Sedaris type of writing. But at the end of each story, I try and find something positive. You know, I just mm-hmm. try and find where the courage came from when I write about what happened to me in the military and, uh, and, and things like that. But yeah, um, my son's passing it definitely changed my life. It showed me I was um, a much stronger person than I ever dreamed. Uh, You had mentioned before about being brave enough to put it out for, you know, the world to see strangers. I didn't for a long time. Uh, If I started to talk about my son, I would, I would sense that wall go up in people, that uncomfortableness that they Mm. didn't, they didn't want to hear this. And uh, it left me feeling very alone for a long, long, long time. And uh, when my youngest son graduated from high school, went off to college, and then he moved to Peru for a little while to teach English, I was sitting in my house and I was looking around and I thought, what am I, what am I doing here? I don't want to be here. I want to be on, I want to be out West. I sold my house. I sold everything I owned. 
another strange coincidence, a friend that worked with me in the airline for the airlines had come to visit and woke up the next morning and she and her husband said they wanted to buy my house. Wow. I sold, I sold them my house and I got one of their SUVs, their Airstream trailer and cash and I took off and that was nine years ago and I'm still on the road. I like to say I'm not homeless, I'm just houseless. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I love that. And it's given me a chance to really delve deep into my grief and following my child. And that's when I started writing and telling with TikTok the world yeah. Um, yeah. my stories. Yeah. And it's been so therapeutic, better, th so therapeutic, better than anything else I've done for myself. What do you love about a nomadic lifestyle? Oh, gosh, the freedom. Uh pushing myself. You know, I definitely have been afraid uh, at times. Normally I feel very safe, mm -hmm. uh, but new situations, uh, going to different countries by myself, listening to, I have finally learned to stop listening to other people's fears. You shouldn't do that. You, you know, yes, uh, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. And, uh, and I've pushed through and I've realized that a lot of the things that we believe are just so screwed wrong, you know, yeah. they're just, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's just freeing. I, I sold everything. I have very little possessions. Um, I actually sold the RV. I currently, I had back in July uh, because I want to get something smaller. It was too big for me. I'm getting older and I don't want to deal with something so big. So currently I've, I was with my daughter for a little while and now I'm wintering with my, uh, my son and in March I'll head back West and I have no idea. I I'm going back <laughs> West to nothing. I'll either get a small RV or I'll buy a small home somewhere like a base so I can continue to travel. Yeah. But there's so much out there that, you know, even in our own backyard yards, even if you're afraid to go and do what I'm doing and just go everywhere. There's so much that you don't even realize is in your own backyard. And uh, we tend to let fear control mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have realized how brave I am over, especially these last few years. And uh, it's a, it's a whole new sense of strength and well, I want to say power, but for myself, yes. Empowerment, and, uh, which is empowerment. personal. Yeah, exactly. There you go. And uh, it makes me excited for what's coming next, even though I have absolutely no idea what's coming next. I love that because what I heard intuitively when you said, I'm going back to nothing, what I heard was, and yet there's everything. I'm going back to everything in, in society's eyes. I'm going back to nothing because people freak out when I tell them, they're like, wait a minute, you don't have a home. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? Aren't you afraid? And in my heart and my mind, I'm just like, Oh, the possibilities. Mm. Yeah. That's so much. That's magic. And that's a, that's a gift that I'm sure you ch you share with your children. And I don't know, do you have grandchildren? I do. Uh, that's where yeah. I am now. I have two grandchildren <laughs> and believe yeah. me, I am, I am daily and well, and they watch their, their, uh, their aunt and uncle too, who are very, uh, outgoing and mm -hmm. living life without, without a whole lot of fear. They, they, they hold back sometimes, but I mean, we uh, have fear. That's kind of my whole platform is we have fear. Fear is what enables bravery. Fearlessness is thoughtlessness, but, but fear doesn't have to own you. Exactly. It can empower you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and the doors open when you become brave enough to step into your own amazing doors open for you. Mm. And there's our quote, folks. <laughs> when you step into your own amazingness, the doors open for you. I, I love that. You have been through so, so much heartache, more than a human should have to experience. And yet you have this beautiful outlook and this glowing soul about you. How do you celebrate? You know, I kind of feel like I celebrate every day. Mm. I, I, I make sure I'm out wandering somewhere, finding something new every day. I celebrate with my family. I, 
I, I think the biggest way I've celebrated recently is being brave enough to finish my book. Yeah. And start looking for a literary agent, uh, trying to figure out if I'm going to self-publish, you know, all these other things. It's just, it's it's my time. That's how it feels now. With mm-hmm. all the different hurdles that I've come through after Eric, uh, nothing will nothing will ever be as bad as losing a child. Nothing. I've lost my yeah. parents. I've been... Uh, I've been hurt by other people physically, mentally, nothing's going to hold me down. And so every day I, I start my day off just being grateful and writing and journaling, just keeping that positivity going and wondering what the day has in store for me. So every day is a celebration. Mm. That is beautiful. I, I wish that really for, for everyone, for everyone I meet, everyone that I work with is to look at every day as a celebration. That is beautiful. Beth, thank you. What is your favorite charitable organization to support? Um, the, uh, the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. I'm sure it, it's starting to be heard a little bit more, the missing and murdered Indigenous women. It just, it's, and enough people do not know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the statistics are heartbreaking. I know it, it's been a little while and I'm sure the numbers have changed dramatically, but in 2016, there were over 5,000 reported wow. missing women. And uh, out of that, I think the number was like 166 were actually looked into. Oh my goodness. Yes. That's tragic. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing the organization with us. They will be our charity of the week. And so folks, you know, get to know them, do what you can. We really are called upon as a global community of one to, to support one another, to look out for one another and to help one another. So thank you for sharing them with us. Beth, will you share your three words with us one last time? Resilient, strength, and nomadic. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, those, I, yeah. You could have picked so many words. There, there were so many options for you, but these feel, they really resonate and certainly resilience, my friend. Wow. Uh, but I, it's such a, you offer such a gift to the world. Thank you. By living it the way, by living your life, the way you're living it and your truth and speaking your truth and holding space for possibility and the unknown. It's really beautiful. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. I, I, I want other women, especially men too, but I want others to know that they're stronger than they realize. I didn't think I was. It took me, I, you know, I'd mentioned the sexual abuse and the, uh, the sexual harassment and attacks and everything back in the military and they silenced me and, I finally got brave enough to stand up and speak out about it. And Mm -hmm. I actually won my claim against the military in this past July. And it was one of the hardest things aside from my child. They, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, They still want to silence you. They still, they don't want to hear it. Yeah. I want, I want to be there to support anyone else that's brave enough to stand up and speak out because nothing's going to change until we all start telling our stories. People need to hear it. It's very easy to say, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I did it for 30 years and I wasn't fine and I'm still not fine. I'm working on it. It's daily. Yeah. And following my child's spirit and being out in the middle of nowhere seems to work for me. It makes me happy and uh, seeing for ever. Uh, Good for you. Just, uh, yeah. yeah, it seems to be what I need. I love that. What nourishes my soul. I am so honored that you tried. This is the first podcast interview you've done, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just got on TikTok in March. Hasn't even been a year. And uh, my son, the, the the oldest now, he's in the film industry. And uh, he's been telling me forever, Mom, you need a YouTube channel. Tell your stories. Tell your stories. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I tried it once and I was like, oh, that was bad. I am, I cannot be in front of the camera. (laughs) And then TikTok came along and I thought, oh, well, I'll give it a try. And uh, so it's, there is something more approachable about the platform 
right? Like there's lots of fake out, but also there's just lots of real. Isn't there? There's Yeah, people aren't ashamed to just show their dirty laundry and say, this is who I am and I'm working on it and uh, just love me for who I am. And yeah. it is, it's, uh, it's, I really enjoy it. I had, I didn't understand it at all when I got on there. <laughs> me either. <laughs> and uh, I was really surprised. I did okay talking about RVs. And then when I started talking about my son, uh, I kind of found a little bit more of a niche and I'm trying not to tell too many stories on there right now where nobody's going to want to buy my book when it comes oh, out. Oh, they're going to buy the book. <laughs> so let me give you a tiny little tip. And for those of you aspiring writers out there, um, they're just, I mean, they're three minute snippets, right? Nobody's going to follow it from beginning to end and the lessons aren't going to be there. Keep, keep telling the stories to get people connected. They will buy the book. I promise. And y'all should follow Beth, it's Wandering Nomad 60, right? That's your TikTok handle. Yes. Yes. Are you anywhere else that they should follow you? Uh, I'm on Instagram. There's a link on TikTok to Instagram. Um, is, that's terrible. I didn't write it down. I think my Instagram is Wandering Nomad 61. Okay. We'll uh, find it out. We'll put it in the show 60. notes. Okay. Because okay. I don't see it. I don't see the link here on TikTok. That doesn't doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, I I'm so grateful that you came. I'm honored to, to be in your sphere now, and I'm looking <laughs> forward to more opportunities to support and connect. And uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing your story with us. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks so much for reaching out to me and finding me. Absolutely. All right, folks, thank you for joining us. I feel very confident that Beth's beautiful, tragic, but beautiful story has touched a part of your soul and your heart. And I thank you for being here. If you like the show, do me a favor, rate and review it and share it with your friends and the little podcast that could. And without your support, we can't continue to grow and share stories, amazing stories like this. And if you're not already following us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, go do that as well. It is my joy, my honor, and my privilege to be on this brave journey with all of you. This is Heather Vickery today and every day reminding you to go out and choose bravely. Bye, y'all. Hey, friends, I want to share something really exciting with you. We already know you enjoy listening to podcasts because you're listening to this one, but I'm also betting you enjoy audiobooks. And hey, listen, if you don't already enjoy audiobooks, then it's time to check them out. That's why I'm really excited to share Libro.fm with you. They are an incredible new platform for listening to audiobooks. And by choosing Libro.fm over other audiobook services, you are supporting a local bookstore of your choice and investing in your local community. Libro.fm offers over 150,000 audiobooks via their primary platform, which, by the way, they built with love and from scratch because they're a small business also. They even offer bookseller recommendations for great audiobook options. You can sign up right now via www.vickeryandco.com slash librofm. That's vickeryandco.com slash L-I-B-R-O-F-M. And when you do, you'll get one free audiobook of your choice and the proceeds will go to your favorite local bookstore. Now, check what I just said there. You're going to get a free book. And the proceeds are still going to go to your local bookstore because Libro.fm makes sure that their booksellers get paid even when they give a promo to customers. I've listened to over 20 audiobooks this year alone. I especially love listening to memoirs read by the author. And it feels great knowing that all of my purchases support my local bookstore, The Book Table, in Oak Park, Illinois. Libro.fm. The same audiobooks, the same price, but a completely different story. Check them out right now at vickeryandco.com slash Libro FM. Have you ever thought about starting a podcast? Maybe you've had this thought and then quickly shut it down because who has the time? Or you don't know how, or gosh, it just all seems too hard. If you have something to share with the world, we want to encourage you to get your message out. The world needs to hear it. Did you know that 50% of all homes are podcast fans? 
If you've ever wondered about having your own podcast or how it can increase your business or get your message across, then please join me and the other experts from the Podcast Power Academy for our monthly free Q&A session. It's called, So You Want to Start a Podcast? This casual live conversation will help you understand how podcasting can be a great decision, why now is the best time to get started, and how to get into action with it. Visit podcastpoweracademy.com to learn more. You've been listening to The Brave Files, stories of people living courageously. To learn more about the show, find our show notes and full episode transcripts, or to get some great bonus content, visit thebravefilespodcast.com. And we would love to know what you think of the show. You can give us a call at 312-646-0205. Let us know your thoughts on the episode, the show in general, or maybe share with us how you're out choosing bravely. This episode is brought to you by Vickery and Co. Success Coaching. Coaching that helps you maintain a life well-lived and a business well-run. Learn more at vickeryandco.com. Our music was created and produced in a custom collaboration with Matt Lewis from ML Creative Consulting, a boutique firm dedicated to helping clients identify their unique sound and amplify their brand with custom delivered soundtracks. We couldn't do any of this without our extraordinary audio engineer, Andrew Olson. Learn more about him and check out his work at findandrewolson.com. And special thanks to everyone on Team Brave from our producers, associate producers, copy editors, writers, and support team. Special thanks to Molly, Mary, Kim, Sabra, and Sabrina. I'm your host and executive producer, Heather Vickery. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week.